little bit reluctant to talk about this subject because I don't like to irritate people, I don't like to confront people, and skepticism has this tendency to challenge many sacred cows. You know, if you're a skeptic, you're a skeptic. It doesn't mean that you are skeptical about everything, but you are skeptical about everything that is extraordinary, that, that makes an extraordinary claim. You know, we, 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 I'll explain more later on. And I'm going to um, sort of, so I apologize if uh, you or some of you may not agree with my views. You know, I hate confrontation. I like to be a Mr. Nice Guy, but sometimes you have to say what you feel. Um, I'm going to start with a quotation by Miguel de Unamuno, who was a Spanish poet and philosopher, who said that skeptic, in 1924, he said, skeptic does not mean him who doubts, but him who investigates or researches as opposed to him who asserts and thinks that he has found. That really skepticism involves three basic principles. You have to be skeptical, but you also have to have an open mind and not be dogmatic. It's against dogmatism, basically. Um, although the skeptical movement I'm in, which is really called scientific skepticism, all right? I mean, it started basically in the 1970s. I'll come to that later on. But skepticism has a history going back even to the 4th century before the Common Era with people like Democritus who saw something which uh, is very important for us nowadays as skeptic that our perception can fail us, can mislead us. Many times what we consider to be extraordinary events are the result of our misguided perception. I will go, in, I'll go into more detail about this, about this perception thing later on, because um, I've got points about it. And then there were the sophists, who were the early group of skeptics, the Protagoras, um, thought about the relativity of knowledge and Gorgias, uh, and even Pirro, who is known as the father of skepticism. All right, these are all fourth, fifth, fourth centuries before Christ, before the Common Era. Uh, Firoz is regarded as the father of skepticism, and later on he held mm, a very extreme position that um, seeing reality is inaccessible. Then there was Arcelaeus, and then in the Renaissance there were others, Michel de Montaigne, Pierre Charon, and Blaise Pascal. Um, but their skepticism, of course, was limited by the knowledge of the age. Really. I mean, uh, you don't expect them to be as skeptical as we are, because their knowledge, their knowledge of science, the knowledge of natural science was quite limited. For René Descartes, skepticism was also a methodology that allowed him to arrive at certain incontrovertible truths. There were others like Pierre Bale, David Hume, who was a leading modern skeptic, and we still use some of his tenets. Um, he challenged the established assumptions about the self, about substance and causality, and we have even a skeptical aspect of Immanuel Kant. But to some degree, skepticism, as we know it today, is based on the scientific method, which demands that all things assumed as facts be questions. The question, of course, um, when we say being skeptical, it has a kind of negative ring to it. Um, it has a ring that uh, it could be, you are being cynical, you question everything. I mean, we don't really question everything, you know. I mean, if somebody, a friend, the person I know, tells me that he was delayed because of traffic, I'm not going to question that, you know, because he's making no extraordinary claim. Tra traffic in Malta is not an extraordinary claim. But if somebody, even a person I trust, you know, tells me that he was delayed, because there was a flying aircraft hovering over the Kapar roundabout, then, oh, I start questioning, because it's not, it doesn't fit in, in my normal mode of, it doesn't mean he's lying, but I question that. So, we are concerned more as skeptics, modern skepticism, all right, that started in, probably, it started before 1975, but 
we will come to that later on. So it questions extraordinary claims. That's the point, and we're going to, uh, to talk about extraordinary claims later on. Um, I'm going to tell you something about my journey, my personal journey. I didn't wake up one morning and said I'm going to be a skeptic. Uh, by the way, um, some people have spoken here, have talked about philosophy uh, objectively. I mean, talked about a particular philosopher, etc. Et Mine is rather subjective. It's very personal. Uh, I feel very strongly about it. Okay, um, it doesn't mean I tolerate. I don't tolerate others, but. Uh, uh, you know, it's something hands-on, it's something practical, which I have tried to um, encourage other people to do in Malta. I haven't managed very very well, but I have tried. I can say I haven't tried. So my journey, you know, my, my, my background is very religious. I was uh, brought up in a very religious environment. This was 1949. I was born, I have studied this. And Museo, when I was young, I have no regrets. I was going to become a priest, so I started started studying, so went to the seminary, etc., etc., um, and then sort of magic, when, you, when you're into magic, when you're a performer, you know, you are interested in how the methods you use, and of course, any new method would be interesting, so if I could really, for example, predict the future, if I could really find a way of predicting, I, I tried to discover it, and I found out that there is no way one can predict the future. There's no way one can communicate with another person. I mean, I tried. I tried um, to... In fact, in fact, I was a chairman of the Parapsychological Society in the 1970s. We tried various experiments. Uh, but after 30 years, and, and I also you know, had a number of programs, which although they were very rational, they were a bit naive. Okay, these programs I did in the 1970s on radio were very well produced. I mean, I used to write a script, not like they do nowadays, they just go and talk and invite somebody to, you know, to were scripted, they were prepared, well researched, but they were rather naive, you know, because if you read books that only focus in one direction, then you tend to be biased. But then after many years, um, I think a turning point for me was the visit of a skeptic who came to Malta by some strange coincidence. His wife was a philosopher, a philosopher lecturer, who came to Malta to give some lectures, and he was here with her, and uh, we met because he, he knew I was interested in the subject, and he introduced me to the various skeptical societies all over the world, and that's when I started, you know, sort of this quest to try and find if the truth, really. Basically, it's a search for the truth. So that is basically my journey. But, but I try to adopt Baroque Spinoza's maxim that I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. Because I believe very much that people prefer to believe rather than to believe. People, people in general prefer to believe rather than to be skeptical. And unfortunately, especially nowadays, that we have these information bites, you know, all the time, short, 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 internet, television, newspapers, people don't go deeply into the subject. They see a pro program about ghosts, and, you know, yeah, you hear that? I've seen a ghost. So, you know, unfortunately, um, to study these subjects, you have to go deeply into them. And there are, there is a kind of, there are four pillars on which my kind of skepticism, the scientific skepticism that I embrace, are based on. One of them is evidence. What is the evidence? And there is a maxim that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Okay, as I said before, if somebody tells me that he or she has seen a flying car, all right, or that he has met a monkey that can talk coherently in sentences, then I would like to see that, I would like to experience that. I cannot rely, I'm sorry, but I cannot rely on what somebody tells me, okay? Because our perception is fallible and we're going to talk about the fallacies of perception later on. Um, so, evidence is important. Is there evidence? Okay? Uh, and there also a combination of rationalism and empiricism. Rationalism that is, you, you analyze something, most of the subjects we discuss at our meetings, we discuss them logically, rationally, academically, rather than based on evidence, because unless you have somebody 
we had Peter, we had a few months ago, or maybe even more, a guy from Russia who said that he could uh, communicate with the minds of people. We experimented with him, we did a test. Of course, he failed the test. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Anyway, so rationalism, uh, and, and, but most of it, most of it is, is, is logic. It's, it's based on logic. It's based on academic. Does it make sense? Is there a logical sequence that binds manifestation? For example, let me just give you as an example: the ghost, the appearance of ghosts. Okay, uh, ghosts are supposed to go through walls. They go through walls. So how can a ghost, if it goes through walls, sort of sit on a chair and not, not fall through? If people have their ghosts appear, why are they wearing clothes? Are there, are there, are there, are, are there ghosts of clothes too? Uh, I mean, these are just logical arguments, just as an example. And then there's the empiricism, gathering knowledge through experience, not through hearsay or anecdotes. And of course, science. Uh, I'm a scientist, um, and many people in our society are not actually scientists, there are a few. Uh, but scientific thinking, rather than magical thinking, is important to analyze these topics. Because scientific thinking is based not on something that we invented. We didn't invent science. Human beings didn't invent science. Human beings discovered the laws of science. The law of gravity was there before Newton discovered it. You know, I mean, it was there. He simply articulated it. So. Uh, as far as we know, the things that happen in our world and in other worlds too, right, have, have to obey the laws of science. So if something doesn't obey the laws of science or seem not to obey the laws of science, all right, uh, so, something which I'll do later on, I mean, what I do in magic as a performing artist, you know, I mean, they don't obey the rules, they seem not to obey. If I levitate a lady, for example, it's something that is not possible, it's absolutely impossible, you know? But I do it, and obviously I use methods, I, that, you know, I cheat. I cheat, basically. So if somebody comes and tells me, you know, I can levitate through yoga, through the tantric meditation, you know, uh, I would have to see. And if I see, most probably I'll find that he's cheating. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to be... <laughs> Prejudice. So, why is this skepticism important, after all? Why, why do I bother? Why do, why do we bother about being skeptical? I believe very much in the truth. I believe very much, I'm not a relativist, I don't believe in relativism, although many philosophers of the 20th century, you know, uh, are in favor of the notion of così e se vi pare. You know, if, it's, if you think it's like that, then it's like that. I believe that there is an objective truth. You know, if you don't believe in gravity, if you go and walk out of the window, you know, you will fall, whether you believe it or not, on it or not. And if I put this piece of paper here on this table, for example, all right, and we all go out, and somebody else comes in, and he, I ask him if there is something on the table, he will say there is something, like maybe it's not a paper, maybe he call it something else, a cardboard, but it is, there is, maybe we're wrong, maybe the, maybe what I'm, I'm talking to an illusion, maybe you're not here, you know? But as far as we know, as far as we can judge, um, there is an objective truth. There is an objective reality. There are some subjects about which we can never really be 100% objective. I mean, when Malta, uh, we had a referendum about going into the European Union, you know, that is not something which you can be 100% about. You can never be 100% about that. I mean, the Brexit thing and, 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 and in the Remain campaign, although you know, although many people have have have, have a, um, a kind of opinion on that, but again, you can never really be hundred percent about what's going to happen. But there are certain things about which we can be more or less certain. So I believe that it's better to know the truth than to live in an illusion, no matter how comforting this illusion is. And I'm going to quote one of my heroes here, Carl Sagan who was a scientist and one of the major skeptics, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. It's a bit complex. It is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. 
That's one of the reasons why I think skepticism is important. Our search for truth, we are surrounded by lies all the time, more than you think. You see programs on television supposed to be documentaries on National Geographic, on, 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 on Discovery Channel. I mean, there are some good ones, but there are also a lot of, there's also a lot of rubbish, I'm afraid. Um, how many times are they going to in search of Bigfoot and then they never, never find a single hair of this Bigfoot or UFOs, etc. So, the truth is important. Another very and much more important point about why skepticism is important is that knowledge leads to progress and leads to exponential progress. Okay? Look at the uh, medical situation. In the past, they used leeches, they used bloodletting, because that's what they used to know, and there wasn't much progress. When we started discovering, you know, germs and viruses and antibiotics, etc., we made so much progress, and many diseases have been practically eliminated, you know, like smallpox, polio, etc., etc. I mean, they have been eliminated, also, although some of them are you know, resurfacing nowadays, but vaccines, uh, medications have had their own mistakes, you know, that, I mean, in, because after all, we are human, we make mistakes, I mean, you take, for example, in the, I think it was in the 50s, which had the thalidomide, the thalidomide problem, when they had this pill for women who are pregnant uh, for nausea and uh, eventually they discovered, it took them a long time to discover that children were born with flippers for hands and missing, you know, parts of the body, etc. etc. But it's a very sad thing. But I mean, yeah, mistakes were made, but more than that, many successes have happened thanks to medicine. So, um, and if the third point I would like to make uh, about why it is important, why, why skepticism is important, is that superstition, although sometimes it may look harmless, probably, you know, I read the astrology column in the newspaper, if I go to a fortune teller, what harm, you know, can it do? Um, yes, maybe it doesn't all the time, but it can also condition people, it can also lead to guilt, to fear, and people uh, taking their own decisions, and it may also lead to nowhere. So I think it's better off knowing the truth, being skeptical, skeptical of extraordinary claims, rather than accepting everything that uh, is placed in front of us. Now, what are the applications of skepticism? Um, I've listed a number of applications, and I'm sure there are more. And uh, the first one I have listed here is pseudoscience. I mean, pseudo, pseudo, pseudo. Huh? It means uh, sort of uh, pretending to be science. Okay. Uh, one of the one of the very important ones at the moment is the anti-vaccine movement. The idea that the anti-vaccine movement, the idea that vaccine the measles vaccine causes autism, which was a study made by uh, a scientist, um, I can't remember the name, I think it was Walker, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, of course, this was, this was a false study, it had various fallacies in it, had many mistakes, but it caught on. And uh, many people, and still even nowadays, people like, what's her name, Anna McCarthy, Jenny, Mac Jenny McCarthy, uh, you know, uh, 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 she's more with a page three, whatever, a pinup girl, you know, she, she's promoting this idea that her son's autism was caused by vaccines. And many people, many people, even nowadays, even in civilized countries, are not vaccinating the children about sicknesses that can be very harmful, not just for them, for the children themselves, but for others who are around them. And this is the problem, you know. That's why it's not in concern only them, because they say, I have a right to protect my child from this vaccine. So this is based on pseudoscience. Science, because science, uh, it, it depends very much on peer review. So, so if, if, if you, 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 everybody can say anything, and anybody can say anything in science, I can, I can come up with a theory, but um, it has to be peer review. It has to be 
reviewed by other scientists. It has to be tested by the scientists. So this is one of them. Another, another thing that you see a lot of, of course, is the question of the UFOs, unidentified flying objects, which is a, an interesting pseudo-scientific occult magical. I believe very much that the aliens are our sort of modern substitute for, for, for demons and angels, really. Um, this, this trend for UFO started, believe it or not, in the 1930s uh, by Raymond A. Palmer, who was, used to publish a magazine called Fate and Amazing Stories, and he, he, he introduced this idea of the flying saucers, of the flying saucers, the magic flying saucers. And then there was a, a, a pilot, Kenneth Arnold, uh, who in 1948, if I'm not mistaken, said that while well, he was on a plane, he saw these things hopping like saucers, and it caught on, and the story of uh, flying saucers became UFOs, became aliens from other planets, from other galaxies who came here to visit us, and then we had the abduction theory, people were abducted and probed, and and uh, you know, etc, etc, etc. Uh, so that is an, another idea of pseudo-scientific theory. Now, of course, uh, we can talk, we can give a whole lecture about this question of UFOs, I'm not going to go into it in great detail. I'm not saying that there is no possibility of life uh, uh, outside this, 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 planet, this Earth. Uh, theoretically, it is possible, until uh, some scientists say that there is a great probability. But having these flying saucers coming, you know, we have no evidence at all. We have no evidence that we have ever been visited by flying saucers. And this leads, this leads us to another pseudo-scientific theory which started in 1990. The first person, person to mention it was Charles Fort, who was the uh, prophet of the paranormal, uh, the 14 Times. It's still being published, the magazine, the 14 Times, uh, which was like tongue-in-cheek magazine, more or less. It still is, you know, with various unusual theories, like uh, uh, raining fish from the sky and raining frogs, etc., etc. And it was he who started. But then, later on, it was Morris K. Jessup, and of course, the person who made most money out of it was Eric von Daniken in 1971 with the, with, the, with the infamous book, Chariots of the Gods, which fascinated all of us who were interested in this subject. At that time, we were sort of, you know, were rather credulous about it. I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I read it with great enthusiasm. But then later on, you discovered that some of the, uh, some of the artifacts, he invented them himself. And also, it is based on a theory that the Egyptians could not possibly have built the pyramids. It must have been aliens who came and helped them to build it. While we have all the evidence nowadays that the Egyptians built the pyramids, we can even see the quarries from which they, from which they carry. But he came up with this notion that, you know, we are sort of hybrids of aliens. And it caught on. I mean, he said... He sold millions of books. He became extremely rich. Uh, uh, Eric von Daniken. For some reason, I, I'm always questioned this. I always ask people about this, and they know this, that Eric von Daniken was a person on Grata Malta for some reason, and I don't know why. I don't know why. Somebody can enlighten me one day why he was a person on Grata in Malta. I know he uh, between 70s and 80s. So he came? So he came twice. Yeah, I know he came to he came Malta, yes, but so why he was a person? Was related to him. Yeah, yeah most probably he came up with some theory which, you know. Anyway, and then uh, the other, so that's pseudoscience, some examples of pseudoscience, which we cannot tolerate. You know, I mean, some people say, oh, yeah, it's okay, you know, you're full. Um, but there are many people who love science fiction. Like Colin, I know, loves science fiction here. Yeah, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with science fiction. As long as, long as you can distinguish between some science fiction books, in actual fact, were predictions of a reality, you know? From the Earth to the Moon, Jews were, you know? I mean, some things happened, really happened. But, but some science fiction but stories are based on impossibility. As long as you can distinguish and you enjoy it for fun, fantasy, there's nothing wrong in that. But making it as if it is science is not right. And then another, another point that one can apply skepticism to, I have actually, so I have to keep it short. Because, uh, another point is conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories 
crop up all the time. Now, listen, I'm, I'm going to mention here, I have, I have 10 points or 11 points or 12 points here. They overlap. So conspiracy theories can overlap with pseudoscience and pseudoscience can, you know, overlap with, with occult, with paranormal, etc. So um, I, I'm, I'm categorizing them for the, 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 the sake of simplicity, okay? So, uh, conspiracy theories. Some people come up with conspiracy theories, like, for example, Bill Casing in 1976, a couple of years after the moon landing, he came up with the theory that it wasn't really a moon landing, it was all made up, you know, it was all a uh, hoax, it was all... Of course, and this, this, these same people believe that aliens visited us thousands of years ago, and they don't believe that we went on the moon. So these are uh, conspiracy theories that you have to analyze skeptically and logically. One of the worst conspiracy theories, of course, was the one in uh, by by uh, Bradley Smith and David Cole, which caught on to not so much, but the Holocaust denial, denying that the Holocaust ever happened. You know. Uh, that is something which caught on for a while. Nowadays, unfortunately, it has gone back. So there are many conspiracy theories, some of them small, some of them big. One there's a conspiracy theory about, about so many about John F. Kennedy's death, about John Lennon's death, you know, and so all the CIA conspiracy. When we know that crazy people shoot people, like we know it from. Huh? The X Files, yes, there's many conspiracy theories there, yes. Um, then there is. The question of belief, which we have to analyze. Um, if, I, if I start talking about belief, I, I believe I would never stop because there are so many beliefs. But one, I'm talking, I'm going to talk about two simple ones. Uh, spiritualism. Spiritualism, uh, the idea that we can actually contact the spirits of the dead has been around for a long time, but uh, it received a big push in 1864, I'm not very good with dates, sorry about this, 1864 I think, it was in, 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 in New York, New York State, uh, there were two girls who told their mother that they were hearing bumps, bumps in the night, hearing, you know, knockings and scratchings, etc. And this became recurrent and the parents sort of, you know, uh, very fascinated by this. They started asking questions, answering yes or no, like yes with one knock and two with uh, no with two knocks. And they started sort of communicating with someone who was supposed to have died in that particular cottage. And uh, eventually many people came to visit and it started a spiritualist, what we call, it, it's, it's almost like a religion, a spiritualist movement. I have friends who are members and they go regularly to these sessions and uh, they communicate with spirits. Uh, the Fox sisters admitted to the Hawks later on, but the belief went on. Because as masculine says, give a lie 24 hours and the truth will never catch up. Catch up. Never catch up. Uh, so these sisters started a movement which went on and on and on. And um, one of the great believers was a famous writer, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I was a great believer in spiritualism. His wife was a medium. The medium is the person who is in between the living and the dead. She's the one who sort of passes on the messages. And uh, a very famous magician was involved at that time because magicians have been involved with the skepticism. That's why they do. Uh, Houdini, the Harry Houdini in, in, in the 19, um, early 1900s, something like that. He was a very good friend of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Very, very good friend. They were very good friends, you know. They didn't agree, but they were good friends, you know, because when you disagree with somebody, it doesn't mean that you're not a friend. And when Houdini's mother died, Houdini was a mummy's boy. He, he was very close to his mother. Um, he missed her a lot, maybe because his father treated her badly, etc., etc. And he asked uh, Karen Doyle to take him to a medium to communicate with his mother. And Houdini, who knew the tricks of the trade, of course, he went there in good faith, you know, hoping that he would really communicate with his mother, but he was so disgusted at the cheating, at the, at the, at the, at the fraudulent methods used, that he started a crusade against these mediums. 
Uh, he ha often had uh, arguments with Sir Arthur. Although they remained friends, but their, their relationship was rather strained after this. And he started a movement and he offered various um, sums of money to anybody who could convince him that he or she could communicate with spirits. And he challenged many mediums of the time um, and he managed to catch them in flagrante, as they say. Uh, and he wrote one of the first books about this. It's interesting. It wasn't the first book about skepticism, but it was one of the first books. It was called The Magician Among the Spirits, which he wrote himself, because Houdini wrote a number of books, in 1924. So one of the beliefs is this spiritualism, which is still found nowadays. Uh, it used to be very physical after the 20th century. I mean, uh, it used to be writing on slates, uh, ectoplasms, you know, like seeing shapes and uh, trumpets blowing and levitations. But since, of course, we have electricity, it was impossible to convince people of these things. So nowadays, mediums just talk. Uh, you've heard of the many mediums in America. Sylvia Brown, for example, who only died recently, who used, you know, people used to ask her questions and used to tell them what the dead people told her about them. It was a lot of nonsense, basically. They never say anything important, really. I mean, so this is one of them. This is one of, you know, one thing that we have to be careful. But many people believe it. I mean, there's a program. I mean, there was a program this year on, on, on one television, I think, with a, with a, I don't know if she's Maltese, medium. I mean, people, people want to believe. I mean, people want this kind of comfort, really. Huh? Should we give them this comfort? Should we, should we let them live this illusion? Well, I don't think we should confront them, really, but, but I think we should educate them not to accept these things. Another, another, another belief is astrology, for example. Astrology, very, we, we had a session about it last time. It's a very, it's got a very interesting history. You know, the notion that some way or other the planets influence us when we are born. That as soon as we come out of the mother's womb, you know, some magnetic or whatever force hits us and makes us into a Hitler or makes us into an Einstein, or makes us into an Einstein, you know, which is a ridiculous notion because the fridge magnet you have on the fridge is more powerful than the magnetic influence of, the, and then some of them are so far away, and you know, we only had 12 characters in the world. So, but anyway, astrology is a subject we can talk about for ages, okay? And we're going to see later on, when we talk about our fallacies of perception, why people believe in astrology. And then, point number four, we are still at point number four, but uh, you know, I'll try to wind up in a, by, by eight o'clock. Okay. Eight o'clock, but we have questions if you want, you know, or if you don't have questions, then I can continue. Um, health and food fats. <laughs> of all people, we have two home economics lecturers here. Um, there are so many um, health and food fads. Now, you may not agree with me here, but um, among the health, you know, this, this idea of alternative medicine, all right, the, 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 the belief that science and the big pharma have kind of a conspiracy uh, to make us spend money, and there are other ways of improving our health, like homeopathy, for example, which is nothing but water. Um, I mean, homeopathy has been tested. Homeopathy has been tested, and it doesn't work. The, the fear of chemicals, for example, people without chemicals. But everything has chemicals. Even this has chemicals. Even salt has chemicals. You know. So this idea that no chemicals added, add, are added. These are fads. These are demon words that people use. The idea of natural, natural food, as if you know, because the word natural has to mean it is real. The word natural has to mean it. If a person is a, is, a, is, a, is a serial killer, we say it's unnatural. So natural is good, but natural doesn't always mean good. You know, poison, hemlock, it is natural. So many things that are found around us, earthquakes are natural. They're not really good, are they? I mean, so they use these words to frighten people. And genetically modified food, for example. That's why are so many people afraid of genetically modified food, you know? Um, the evidence doesn't show that there's anything wrong with them. It, it may even help people who um, have no source of food 
as we have to obtain food more easily. And it also... Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and, and funnily enough, the people who are, make these, who are making these foods, which are supposed to be natural, uh, uh, are the same companies that make the other food, and they, they send, sell them at a higher price. But anyway, so these are some of the fats and diet fats. For example, I'm not saying that diets aren't important and to eat, you know, but um, they sell lots of pills and lots of things that don't work. So, uh, among the other subjects, there's also cryptozoology. Which is an interesting subject. Um, it, one, one of the first pioneers of cryptozoology. Cryptozoology means creature zoology about creatures that are unknown. Um, of course, the, you all know about the Loch Ness monster, about Bigfoot, about the Yeti, about the Sasquatch. You know, there's nothing paranormal about them, really. There's nothing paranormal, but you know, they're highly improbable. And so far, we have not discovered any evidence. But there's a, a kind of fascination with them when we have so many species of creatures around them. I mean, millions of species. And more are being discovered. We, we always want to find the things that are not there, that don't exist, like the Loch Ness Monster, you know, which is, a, of course, a result of too much scotch being drunk around the Loch Ness. Um, so the, the, the pioneer of cryptozoology is Rupert T. Gould, and then Evan T. Sanderson, and Roger Patterson was very famous for the Bigfoot film, which was a hoax, you know, uh, somebody dressed up as a, as, a, as, a, as a gorilla, and he filmed him with, of course, a very fuzzy camera, and everybody was, oh, goodness, well, there's Bigfoot, there's a film of Bigfoot, etc., etc. And there were many others, Hoevelmans, and, of course, the Loch Ness Monster, Books have been written about the Loch Ness Monster. I went to Loch Ness to see it myself. I never saw it. Uh, um, of course, the probability is that it doesn't exist. Uh, of course, the, the, the burden of proof lies on the one who says it exists. I don't have to prove that it doesn't exist. You know, the person who says it exists has to prove it. But the probability of it existing is very remote because, I mean, it doesn't, it's just their only one. It doesn't have any you know, offspring. Have they, haven't they found any skeletons at all after so many years? Okay, uh, other things like faith healing and psychic surgery. I'm going to rush a bit here now because I want to come to some important point. Faith healing and psychic surgery, you know what faith healing is? You go to this person, it touches your head, you fall down to the ground, heal, 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 you know, etc., etc. And the psychic surgeons of the, the Philippines, where they actually operate you with their bare hands and they move things, of course, it's a trick. And it has been replicated by magician, the famous magician James Randi. Um, of course, I am, I'm, 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 then, then perhaps one of the biggest, the paranormal and psychic claims. You know, believe in ESP, believe in predictions, dowsing, etc., etc. Carl Sagan in the book The Demon Haunted World says, I worry that especially as the millennium edges nearer, pseudoscience and superstition will seem year by year more tempting. The siren song of unreason, more sonorous and attractive. Where have we heard it before? Whenever our ethnic or national prejudices are aroused, in times of scarcity, during challenges to national self-esteem or nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place and purpose, or when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of the thought familiar from ages past reaches for the controls. The candle flame gutters. Its little pool of light chambers, darkness gathers, the demons begin to stir. Uh, the idea, and he also wrote in another book, um, which was published after he died, his wife published it, that human beings have a learning disability. We don't learn from history. So we should really think critically, even about subjects like racism, for example, you know, about this extreme nationalism which is cropping up nowadays, you know, um, that we should think of science as our guiding light. It is not perfect, it is very effective, has its, um, you know, pitfalls and its um, weaknesses, but I think that if we follow the evidence, follow the empirical and rational evidence, we could be on the right track. Thank you very much for your attention.